All right, we are live. I am just going to invite Talia in. Co-host here. Here we go. She is. Hello. Oh, we had a few glitches there. <laughs> this is where, okay, this is what I was expecting, to see the live. <laughs> Now we're, now we're live. Now we're live. Great. Okay. <laughs> anyway. We'll so, say Alia. I know. Nice to catch up, Mark. I this know. This is awesome. I know. Yeah. Very good. This is good. This is like a new experience for me is to, is to double live on Instagram. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't you tell us about yourself and then, um, yeah, we can get chatting. And then I'll introduce you. Yeah, so welcome everybody, whoever's watching. I see some people join, which is awesome. Eight people already. Uh, so I'm Dr. Talia Marcajani. I'm a naturopathic doctor. And my focus is mental health, hormones. Uh, those are, would be the conditions that I, I like to focus on. But I think, you know, underlying most health conditions that I see is metabolic health issues, digestive issues, inflammation, um, you know, gut health, microbiome, biochemistry, hormones are usually at the core of a lot of things. So that's what I like to work with and what I like to learn about. And then that and, and how that can improve and impact our mental health. And I am here today with Martha Sharp, Dr. Martha Sharp. And I'm just gonna read your bio <laughs> behind my phone. <laughs> and Martha is a very interesting guest, really good naturopathic doctor and a cancer survivor. Uh, whose practice revolves around supporting people through all stages of cancer, but particularly about helping people find the clarity, empowerment, and confidence to step back into their life after cancer and feel at home in their bodies again, which is such an interesting niche because we hear a lot about, you know, what do I do when I'm diagnosed? What do I do to prevent cancer? Like this is where the conversation usually surrounds, but so many people are cancer survivors and don't know what to do next. So it's a really cool well, it's a, it's, you provide. Yeah, it's a massive gap in care, I think, that I found myself, but also in the people that I work with. Um, mm -hmm. It's such a stark transition from active treatment to survivorship. So mm -hmm. that's really where I am so passionate about supporting people. That's and so I cool. think what, just because I know today we're talking about just nourishment and why why it can be so hard um and i think that's such a great topic to talk about because one of the main themes i see in my practice and i'd love to hear um your your feedback too is um people feeling so much shame and guilt and frustration around food and knowing what to mm -hmm. eat and I think there's, we've sort of as a society lost this intuition and, and that deeper knowledge about food and how to feed ourselves, not just from a food standpoint, but from like an, a deep nourishment standpoint, because food is so much more than food. It is you know, the building blocks to our body, but it also is soul food, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the biggest problems there is just the amount of misinformation around nutrition online, in the yeah. online space. Because you could have, you know, two websites saying two completely different things about something, um, you know, dairy is the devil and, mm -hmm live without dairy you know I'm sure you have conversations about that with people every day and another thing I think is is um is we as this sort of modern society tend to really I mean I think there are some good intentions behind it but we tend to have this sort of reductionist mm -hmm. goal mm -hmm. point of view where we I think the, the underlying um, intention is to learn more about things, and, and that's a good intention, of course. But I think what happens with that is we sort of pare foods down to their individual parts, and we sort of only 
really identify food sometimes as their individual parts and forget the rest of the whole complete food. Yeah. For example, cholesterol in eggs, you know, yeah. like what people know about eggs. Right. Never mind the choline and the protein and all that, that other stuff that comes with it. But yeah, totally. Or practice, like what are your, yeah. Why, why is your po patient population finding it so hard to nourish themselves? Yeah, I wrote, I was like thinking about this for a conversation. I wrote down some ideas, like kind of like a mind map. I'm like, I think the first one you said it is information, right? There's, there's deliberate misinformation, you know, food industry, big food for sure. And this gets a lot of attention, but then there's also, you know, we have our own biases, our own goals and standards and our own ideas and how that may be conveyed. Like your, your favorite Instagram influencer may be like selling some supplements and has a lot riding on the fact that, that you know, you follow a specific kind of diet, right? Um, right? Or they, they have a, their own agenda, right? Maybe they want to save the world and that's contingent on everyone eating plant-based, that that's sort of what their idea is. So there's going to be representation that is incomplete, let's say. And then nutrition research is really hard to follow. It's mostly epidemiological studies and it's highly biased. It's really hard to study nutrition because it's hard to follow nutrition perfectly and nobody does. And you can't account for all the factors. And we have some well-known biases called healthy user bias and unhealthy user bias. So like if I tell you, Martha, if you're like kind of a health minded person, I tell you that meat is really bad for you. You're not going to eat meat, but you probably also do a lot of other good things that are good for your health. Like you might exercise and you might decide to quit smoking and to moderate your drinking and to have social relationships and all these other things. And so you cut out meat, but then you do all these other healthy behaviors. And so if I see that you have good health outcomes or people like you, is it because you didn't eat meat or because of all these other things you're doing? Right. So th this is confounding factors. It's really common in nutritional research. So when it's like, you know, red meat is bad, it's like, well, <laughs> you know, how are most people consuming it? You know, usually in the form of like McDonald's burgers, <laughs> like, a, like a super size meal, right? <laughs> and um, then we have issues with planning, like just on the ground, even if people know what to eat, how do you make it work? How do you implement it in your family? How do you meal plan? How do you organize it? Like, I mean, and, and how do you... Uh, like, you know, the, the sort of cognitive requirements for meal planning and organizing your food intake and overriding what's just readily available. Like what if you just walk into a convenience store hungry and just kind of pick the first thing that you that looks appetizing, the chances are it's not going to be a nourishing food, you know. And so there, it requires sort of like not only nutritional knowledge, but this, this planning ability to have a snack prepared, to know where to go, to know how to pick something. Like, how do you triage it? Like, if patients are experimenting with avoiding gluten, for example, and then they need to go to Tim Hortons to order something, they're like, I don't know, do I just say to hell with it? Or do I order the Timbits? Or do I, like, you know, what's more important, right? Um, well, yeah. I think that's an important piece there is that we people you know there's that inherent sense of failure like mm -hmm. always with food and mm -hmm. um, we're getting so much misinformation but we don't have the ability to plan or implement properly sometimes but it's because in a large part we have this sort of world yeah. now you have to do everything yourself right we are yeah we're the homekeeper we're the we're working we do child care there's just so many hats that people wear mm -hmm. and so planning meals is exhausting yeah such an emotional component there too I think um at least with the people that I work with um mm -hmm. which almost is um you know set someone up for this cycle of negativity with yeah. with the no. It's yeah, like, it's, yeah. Get ahead and stay ahead, but there's that cycle of kind of one step forward, two steps back, and mm. or steps forward, one step back, but it's the one step back that 
you know, people focus on something. super discouraging. Yeah. Like and that. it's hard enough, right, to figure out how to feed yourself when you're thinking or you're considering a family and kids. And then your naturopath specifically puts you on right. whatever it might be. Is it a plan or is it just let's focus on getting enough protein or let's try and, you know, eat more breakfast? Like whatever, you know, your recommendations are, now you have to take that into account with everything else that you're already considering, right? And, and sometimes it's just, it's too much. And I saw, like, one of our colleagues, um, said this i have to credit her jordan robertson she uh said something about like she's like you know you're not gonna be good at it right away <laughs> so when you're there with all your containers and you're figuring out how to like <laughs> prep your protein for the week or whatever it is it's like it's not gonna look good right away you're not gonna have like your soup portioned out properly or the lunch is organized and so giving yourself like like anything giving their leeway for there to be like 10 imperfect attempts before you really get it organized and then it becomes like brushing your teeth like it's something that you know if someone explained to you that twice a day every day for the rest of your life you'd have to put some stuff on your teeth and sit there and brush them you'd be like oh my gosh I can't deal with that I can't add that to my plate but because it's something that you do routinely every single day ideally I mean, <laughs> I mean I'm sure some of us don't brush each other, but you know what I mean <laughs> it's it becomes habit it's something you don't think about it's just something that kind of has to happen um, and so that's sort of the idea, I think, but a lot of the time habit change, we give our patients too much to do at once. That's a problem too, too I think like, I agree. I, yeah. Like I have the tendency of getting excited, like, oh, and then we're going to do this. And it's like a Michelangelo chipping away at a marble sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to fix your whole life. And then it's like, okay, no, we have to really backtrack. Let's just focus on like making breakfast, uh, nourishing for the next three months or six months that's our goal you know sometimes it's that well and I think that's a, a really good point about um practitioners even almost inadvertently kind of contributing to that anxiety you know and mm. it's not intentional of course um but it almost sets people up into thinking that food is um, I'm not sure if this is the right word, but the enemy. Yeah. Um, like they're vilifying certain aspects of food, whether mm -hmm. or not they're they're reading it on some information online, or their practitioner is maybe putting them on a gluten free diet for whatever mm -hmm. reason. But then that becomes is gluten the mm -hmm. devil, and and there's this sort of. Um, terrible kind of relationship that forms sometimes and I think mm. that's so hard to navigate and to manage and reverse and and for there to be that I talk about this all the time but that sort of gray area of it doesn't mm. have to be perfect mm -hmm. we let we we live so much you know in this go 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 perfection sort of performance achievement mentality that if we mm -hmm. can have our perfect seven day meal plan set up mm -hmm. with the right amount of protein with every you know meal and snack it's like oh I can't do it so I'm just gonna give up and there's yeah. that sort of almost vilification of of food and then and then but then the treat so I might as well right treat myself, which whatever, and that can mean different things to different people. Um, but often, mm -hmm. you know, we're reaching for things that are feeding our, you know, happy hormones that are often foods that are literally designed, like right. there are huge groups of people that their job is to design food. And, and I mean, they're more of a product i would argue yeah sometimes like an edible food like product that's isn't that michael pollan's uh yeah <laughs> i love michael pollan i know he's so good but but it, it you can see how you know that on its own like we have teams of people designing foods mm -hmm. that we become that that we then end up craving and that we're addicted to not in the sense of you know 
what we think of as uh, that addiction um, to the extreme, but but we actually mm-hmm. can have similar body chemistry reactions to to foods, right? Yeah, as totally. As substances and other things. So it's it. I think that is a really hard part too, because we are those things are marketed to us as healthy alternatives. It's it's mm-hmm. all about marketing. Anyway. Yeah, like even in the health food section, you know, the, exactly. yeah. there's still, there's still foods that, you, like you said, are designed to hit the satiation point. Right. The, um, and it's interesting, like I, for Sober October, I cut out caffeine. I'm having it right now though. <laughs> so <laughs> we're all human. <laughs> New slash to everyone. But uh, not caffeine, I cut out coffee. And I literally had a thought a few days ago where I was like, oh, I want a coffee. It, was, it wasn't super strong like at the beginning, but it was like, kind of like, oh, you know, I kind of want a coffee. And then I was like, and then the next thought was like, oh, right, you're not having coffee right now. Um, you're just going to have to work harder for your happiness. <laughs> and I'm like, that was such a hilarious. It was like just this spontaneous thought in my head. I'm like, that is kind of, I think too, like we're, we're very, like you said it, right? We're so, a lot of us are burnt out and we're tired. And then food is another stress. And, and it, with, is this diet culture? Is this because we use our heads for our bodily decisions? You know, like we've been trained kind of to, yeah. to, to like James Hillman, there's a psychotherapist, psychoanalyst that says it in one of his lectures. He's like, we in our society, we grab a loaf of bread and we look at the ingredients, <laughs> right? Instead of tasting the bread. And like, you know, a hundred years ago, you would have just, is it taste good? Does it not taste good? But at the same time, what you're saying is also relevant because it's like a hundred years ago, we could kind of trust bread because it would likely just be flour, water, yeast. Now we have to like get on top, almost like get ahead of the fact that there's stuff that's being added to our food that our bodies maybe aren't used to. What do, how do we deal with that? Like, you know, what do we make of that? Do we obsess about it and try and avoid all toxins at all costs? Do we, you know, accept that there's going to be a certain amount of toxic exposure and, and there's a certain level of information that we could benefit from, but too much may be harmful. How do we navigate that? Like, that's a huge question. I don't have the answer to that one. I'm going to say I, that's something that I really struggle with um, just with my own health history of of Mm. had cancer, but also in the population. Mm work with it's like do you choose to view your food as that where you're kind of having Mm. to triage what you're eating you know from an exposure Mm. perspective or the opposite end of the spectrum are you just viewing it as nourishment Mm -hmm. but then again back to that gray zone it's so hard to for both things to be true. We live Mm -hmm. in this sort of like, it's either true or not true world. And sometimes both things can be true. You know, it's, it's a really hard balancing act. Yeah. I think one of the things that um, I wanted to talk to you about today in particular, which I think is, is one of the main results of this sort of, problem and why it's so hard with nourishing ourselves is that one of the main results is blood sugar dysregulation Mm -hmm. because we you know punish ourselves almost with food you know if we Mm -hmm. if we had a burger yesterday oh my gosh today I can only have a salad you know it's it's so it becomes this punishing zone I don't anyway I mean, I, I feel like I do a little bit of that myself, and I think we're all on some, what of a spectrum of that on some days, but um, yeah. hard to manage. But I think one of the main results is that blood sugar dysregulation. And for my patient population, so what does that even mean um, for, for our listeners? And we actually had a question. Mm-hmm. I want to touch on that later. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> blood sugar okay. dysregulation. I just saw it pop up. Blood sugar dysregulation is just when you are um, your body is not able to manage sugar coming into the cells from the blood as it might have previously. 
with with different hormonal activity. Primarily, the one that we talk about is insulin. So insulin resistance is that sort of um, other, it's another term, to make it simple, for this blood sugar dysregulation that we see a lot. Um, and insulin resistance is a huge risk factor for my patient population because yeah. it's not really about the sugar feeding cancer statement. It's more about insulin being, being the problem and insulin resistance being the problem. Um, and the, but when you're eating a diet of very high sugar or carbohydrate, simple sugar foods um, all throughout the day and you're getting that spiking in insulin to try and break sugar into the cell, that's when you sort of are feeding that cycle of insulin resistance. Um, and it has been linked with an increased risk of um, 13 different types of cancer, um, in yeah. particular, which I see more of, and colorectal cancer. Um, so, but in, in your patient population, I can only imagine the mood disturbances, the fatigue, you know, mm -hmm. we get all symptoms from this hormonal kind of um, result of the way that we're eating and it, it it's actually giving us symptoms and making us feel worse even though in the moment we think that we're grabbing something that makes us feel really good um yes. and not that we shouldn't be doing that that's really not i don't think the message that we're trying to get across today it, but it's more about um figuring out a way to have these foods that you love but also in a balanced way but what mm -hmm. do you see in your practice with respect to blood sugar kind of yeah it's, cause. it's like kind of my obsession is this like when i say meta I'm talking about this like insulin resistance blood sugar regulation like our literally our metabolism how you take food and use it for energy and this is because it, it's sort of this baseline issue so if it's there it's gonna drive most people's symptoms so it has to be corrected first so people be like oh since i you know, it's entered into perimenopause, I'm noticing weight gain, um, or people want to prevent dementia, if they have family history of dementia, it all comes down to, unless proven otherwise, unless, you know, metabolic health and insulin resistance and blood sugar regulation, and, you know, even anxiety, mood swings, energy levels, it's all blood sugar. And I think, I don't know why it's such a big issue. It could be like, how we've been trained to eat via the food guide, the foods available to us, this vilification of like animal foods, protein, uh, the fat phobia that's been going on for a while that is still in people's consciousness. Um, I think also stress contributes, right? Because every time we release cortisol, it lowers our, uh, our um, raises our blood sugar, and that can increase insulin. So whether you eat or not, I had a type one diabetic patient who was using a continuous glucose monitor. And it was so interesting because she was like, before an exam, I literally had a blood sugar spike equivalent to what I would get if I had two donuts. It was crazy. And she had not eaten anything. She was just waiting for an exam. Yeah. yeah. You know, wow. so, you know, we lack sleep. Like, also muscle mass, you know, you need muscle on your body to be able to soak up glucose in, yeah. a, in a healthy way, right? So, and that also keeps you insulin sensitive. But even before insulin resistance, you can be on a bit of a blood sugar roller coaster based on stress, based on your digestion, based on food choices. Like what do most people have for breakfast and think nothing of it? Like a muffin, a croissant, a bowl of cereal, uh, a fruit smoothie, you know, <laughs> like right. most of our breakfasts are sweet. And we don't, unless you're thinking actively and consciously about, and this is kind of um, uh contradiction because before I was like oh we have to pay that into our bodies but th this is I think an issue is that we don't like I don't know about you Mark but I never crave protein I'm never like oh I could go for like a nice chicken breast right now yeah. it's more mental like my body wants after a three-hour surf I want potato wedges from Tim Hortons it's very specific like <laughs> that's what I want I want carbs and I want salt so I have to actively kind of consciously remember to eat some protein um, and I think what could be helpful for people is to like organize that a little bit. Is like I always tell you, like have you know, like have your carbs with other foods, like kind of balance them with protein and fat. But pay attention 
like it, there's nothing wrong with eating to feel good. I mean, ultimately that's what responding to hunger and cravings, which I believe have wisdom behind them. Ultimately that's what being in bodies is all about. Is like you, you, you feel thirsty. So you drink water to feel better, but how do you feel? It, it's also about paying attention to how you feel 30 minutes from when you satiated that urge. And then, you know, a few hours later and then pay attention to patterns throughout the day. Right. So a lot of us are like, I can make really healthy choices in the morning, but by four o'clock it all goes to shit poop. I don't know. <laughs> whatever word. <laughs> um, it all goes to like, it all goes down the toilet at 4 PM. I'm, I'm eating cookies and I'm craving all kinds of things. And I'm like, well, the, it's not that they're like, I've, I've lost my willpower or something or, they, they kind of attribute it to some sort of mental uh, dysfunction or some sort of like moral right. failing. Yeah. And I'm like, it's okay. Well, let's look at what you had for breakfast. So for breakfast, you had a bowl of cereal or, you know, your healthy cereal, skim milk. And then for lunch, you had a salad with chicken breast. You know, you didn't really eat that much for lunch or sandwich. And then, yeah, by four o'clock, your body is asking for nourishment or right? you've been on kind of a blood sugar roller coaster all day. And now it's really hitting you around four. Um, when your body is unable to regulate your blood sugar via cortisol, right? right? So paying attention to these patterns could be helpful to people. And a lot of it is like, like front loading calories and almost it's like, you know, packing a lunch. It's like preparing yourself for regulating blood sugar throughout the day. Um, and I think a little bit of that has to do with like our awareness of our bodies, paying attention to patterns, people pointing things out to us that we wouldn't necessarily intuit on our own. Um, so I think that in that sense, that's where our using our cognition and our mind is helpful for eating well, you know, I think, but just, again, I always compare things to back in the day, like a hundred years ago, we would be eating like eggs and bacon for breakfast. There'd be butter on your plate. There'd be toast. There'd be a combination of things that probably wouldn't be just cereal on its own, you know? Um, and so we'd naturally eat in a way that would regulate our blood sugar, and now with a combination of things, right? Low fat, like vilification of animal foods, vilification of fat and cholesterol, um, this sort of like diet culture, trying to eat as low calorie as possible. And these types of things have influenced us to, to focus more on carbs um, and, uh, and, and more like readily available processed foods that are usually more grain-based, you know? Um, yeah. Just that, um, we also eat differently from like a nervous system perspective. Like back mm -hmm. in the day, you would sit down, mm -hmm. have the time to eat. Now everyone's running somewhere. I mean, our morning was an hour. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's, it doesn't, which then spikes your cortisol, which then, it's kind of, there's a lot of contributing factors, I think, is what we sort of wanted mm -hmm. to get across today. It's yeah. not about people's willpower. Mm -hmm. It's about all of these other sort of systemic things that come with, I would argue, our society mm -hmm. uh, and the way that we sort of have to thrive in, have to thrive, I mean, that could be an argument for another day you don't yeah. have to do any <laughs> society to be a productive member of society anyway but um you know what i mean like there's all <laughs> the other systemic issues that we sort of just think are norm are our normal and and we just end up blaming everything on us and and you know yeah we're, that we're not nourishing ourselves properly but we just i think need better information and I think we need mm -hmm. communities where we can share more about this um, mm -hmm. you know people don't even think that other people are on the same roller coaster as them but anyway I yeah. uh, it, it's really a result of our system yeah and I think and for and some I reason we tend to moralize food more than other habits like I don't know if there's that same moralization around like sleep and exercise and right keeping your closet tidy right it's like we have this thing around food and I, is it like is it diet culture is it 
big food? Is it this confusion? Is it because it's a very basic need that, you know, I mean, the food takes about five steps to get from the place it was grown or extracted from, like the egg from the chicken takes five steps before it reaches your grocery store and then gets into your house. So we're five steps removed from the actual source of our food. This is another thing, another topic, right? Is that yeah. we're not really, it, it becomes abstract in a way, right? I go to the grocery store and I buy eggs and I don't know the difference between free run eggs or these other eggs. I, I have to trust other humans in order to nourish myself. Right. And that's difficult if you start to tell me, well, maybe you can't trust everyone. Maybe there's some discernment that's required that it's like, oh, okay, now I got to do all this work. <laughs> like, why can't I just walk into a grocery store, grab what I need and go home and get on with my life? Right. And so, yeah. And that reliance on external factors just sort of perpetuates that lack of intuition, right? Yeah. Lack of feeling that you can know what you know feels mm -hmm. your body i loved how you talked about it's not just about how you feel immediately when you eat the food yeah. it's always gonna feel really good immediately but it's right. how you're feeling later and the patterns of of that later that i think give you more information exactly yeah and it's just an honest inquiry into one's like how you feel, right? Because yeah. you want to feel good. And if you feel good, then, I mean, this is a bigger topic, but one, one could argue that if you feel good, you don't have to justify that to anyone. <laughs> right? Right. You just have to justify it to yourself. So, you know, there is this, maybe we feel bad about this trade-off of immediate pleasure for feeling bad later. But I think when we talk about, you know, I have a colleague, Agley Jacob, um, and her whole thing is nourishment. She's a, she's a great person to follow. I think it's Radicata Nutrition. Um, but she'll talk about, you know, intuitive eating, which is, is not necessarily a free-for-all where you just go and eat whatever, right? Unless this is like part of your recovery from something. But it is like intuitive. It's what, what does my body want? And at first that practice is going to be really messy because like my body wants pizza, potato wedges. Okay. Now I'm going to, so if I give myself pizza and potato wedges, how do I feel? Well, right, right away, I feel fantastic. In half an hour, maybe, maybe I feel great. Or maybe I feel bloated. Maybe I feel tired. Maybe I'm craving all kinds of things. Maybe I'm moody. You know, maybe if I do this for a few days, I feel really like I don't want to exercise and I don't want to engage with my friends in the same way. It's just about observing, you know, and this is not an easy thing to do. It takes time awareness sucks <laughs> most of the time right <laughs> but process. yeah exactly it's a process and and it takes and this is the thing you know that they don't tell you in the fine print is that these things take years you know like your your influencer who you might idealize this person's been on a journey for years if they're authentic you know um well i just i had meant to talk about this earlier but just on that awareness piece just um, that shift in becoming aware of these sort of ultra processed foods being mm -hmm. high in energy, high in energy and calories, but really nutrient. Right. 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 Don't even, we're sort of just so unaware as a society of that piece. Yeah. I talk to, don't mean to um, point fingers, but anyway, it's a good example. Uh, my dad <laughs> that like a burger at McDonald's is the same burger as he grew up with but how could you right. not think that it's a burger is a burger you know it's just mm -hmm. it is that awareness piece it's that um gentle awareness I think too mm -hmm. and having yeah. self-compassion for it's not anyone it's not your fault that you don't know that why on earth would you know this we're not taught this kind of stuff mm -hmm. um but really clear i think with both of our patient populations that you know nourishment is only you know going to reduce our symptoms that mm -hmm. many of our symptoms that we're coming in with and it's going to make us feel better going forward and reduce risk of you know a number of different health mm -hmm. concerns chronic diseases and everything really but yeah 
almost have another Instagram I know. talking about. <laughs> I know. I would. I would yeah. love for you to come on my podcast, Martha. <laughs> Let's oh, do it. Yeah. So I had a question about someone was on an insulin resistant summit recently and they were told that nuts were a bad snack. And I would, I would strongly disagree with that. Um, but I'm not really sure what the, what the I mean, that was. could be coming. So, okay. Yeah. This is the, this is the, this, you spoke with this, the, the reductionistic thing, right? So I've had like cholesterol and eggs a patient was like, should I eat bananas? I'll say this, it's likely not a whole food that is your problem. Like, I don't necessarily want to frame it like that, but the problem, it's yes. likely not a whole food, right? That's the issue, <laughs> you know? Like 65% of the North American diet is ultra processed foods. So these are not just processed foods like your Doritos, but ultra processed. So this is like, you know, foods that really don't really resemble like they they're like they were created in a factory our ancestors never encountered these foods so nuts is probably and this is where we pull things out in epidemiological research you're not going to see this trend where nuts are bad for you because people that consume nuts likely have a lot of other good health habits and the nuts they're not going to be so bad that you see it pulled out in the in the research right same with legumes same with yogurt like <laughs> these foods are likely beneficial are they beneficial for you specifically that's just kind of what we're talking about i don't know right because some of us have sensitivities some of us um have certain preferences i think nuts are more like most likely going to regulate blood sugar all right so they'll prevent Ooh, a yeah. glucose spike right so there's a really good instagram account called glucose goddess um, she has these, I don't know how she gets this information to be honest, but I think she wears a continuous glucose monitor and she'll do these little experiments on herself where she'll eat like a fruit smoothie and then her glucose will spike. And then she'll be like a fruit smoothie with 10 almonds. And then you'll see the glucose, the glucose curve is a lot flatter. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really cool to look at her because it, it really changes the frame around restriction, even when we're talking about blood sugar. So she's a really cool person. I'll show patients her because they, they get scared if they get diagnosed with insulin resistance. Um, they, get, they get worried. And so then we look at the, her charts and they're like, they're usually very empowered by the end. They're like, oh, I don't have to like stress out too much. It's small little things about organizing my food in a different way. I mean, there is this conversation around seed oils <laughs> that is, are probably not great for um, our mitochondria and may, you know, do like impact our insulin sensitivity but the seed oils are likely not coming from like whole nuts. when we say seed oils you know what i'm talking about are the like highly processed industrialized oils like vegetable oil corn oil canola oil soybean oil which are put in, in everything and I, I don't you know well I and potato I wedges yesterday i had seed oils in those for sure um, are they is it the seeds themselves that are the issue again i don't think so it's like and, it, and if we're if we're reducing our, our processed foods and consuming whole foods we're probably doing a lot of what we can to move away from the like we said the ultra processed foods that includes those like industrialized oils well and i was going to mention sometimes you know you think you're grabbing a hand of a handful of almonds but really they're you know the roasted with whatever yeah. oil have added so maybe that's what part of that conversation was about too but um i think yeah. we could have a few other instagram lives i know so how yeah. can people get in touch with you or or is there anything that you're sort of working on that people can i i am yeah i mean so you can follow me on instagram if you don't already Dr. Talia ND and my and then I have a link tree link too yeah and, the, and then in my bio there's links to my website my podcast um, courses that I run that, that are currently DIY but probably in the future they'll be we'll run them live we'll do different things I'm so focusing great. on a, on a master's right now so I'm not really in, as invested in making these courses um, but yeah, the podcast is pretty consistent and, Mar and you'll see Martha on there one day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what about you, Martha? What are you plugging today? 
I'm, uh, but this is one of the most common topics that I talk about in my practice. Mm -hmm. And one of the, mo the biggest concerns is that what on earth do I eat post cancer? And mm -hmm. I'm doing everything wrong, overwhelmed, confused, just everything is so fear based. So I'm doing a free webinar next Tuesday. And it's my top three nutrition strategies for that I wish anyone post cancer knew. Um, and we're going to talk about just how you can bring more peace into your eating with food, in, in particular from that mm. cancer prevention perspective and recovery, you know, we don't sort of value and focus on recovery as much so it sounds but why, awesome but those yeah I'm excited about yeah. it I know that you're I've seen some of your material before like your course material before and that's awesome too so I hope that mm -hmm. some of you check that out and and I'll I'll post your links on my Instagram and thank you so much for chatting today honestly thanks Martha we'll do it again and I'll yes. excited to come on the podcast I know yeah let me know when you're available we'll have you on and uh I'm excited for your webinar. It sounds really good. Yeah, I'm excited too. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. And um, yeah, maybe you'll see us together soon again. <laughs> thanks everybody. Thanks, Amy. <laughs>